Hello, everybody. Welcome again to another edition of the MCHD Paramedic Podcast. This is Dr. Casey Patrick, and I'm lucky to have a special guest from the community, from the local healthcare community, to talk to us about an underappreciated, underrecognized problem in emergency care. I have uh, Melanie Gonder with us. Melanie is a nurse with Memorial Hermann. She's uh, in the trauma service line, the director of the trauma service line there, and she has a really interesting story to tell, and I'm not going to give away the topic just yet. I'm going to get let Melanie kind of lead in, tell the listeners about yourself and how you got here in that chair on the MCHD Paramedic Podcast, because honestly, it, it's a good one, and it'll lead us right into the topic, and it's one that everybody can learn from. Great. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. As uh, Dr. Patrick said, my name is Melanie Gonder, and I'm a nurse with Memorial Hermann Health System. I work at our corporate offices. I've been a nurse for over 24 years now. Uh, Back in November of 2009, my husband and I had our second child, our son, and everything was going great. Uh, And about a month into it, we got, probably about two weeks into it actually, we got his newborn screening back, the little heel prick test they do on all newborns in the hospital. And it came back positive for congenital adrenal hyperplasia. And at that time, I had been a nurse for over 10 years, and I was clueless. I had never heard of it, had no idea what that was. So I start Googling and researching and everything. We spent about the next two weeks doing various lab results to try to confirm a diagnosis. And eventually, at one month of age, he was confirmed as having uh, salt-wasting congenital adrenal hyperplasia. And so that began my husband and I's journey, basically, of learning and educating on everything we can. We, everything has been, was going smoothly, and then one morning he didn't wake up. And my husband and I had both left for work. We had a live-in nanny. And so we both had early meetings. We got up and left. And around 9 a.m., I was in a meeting with my boss and a neurosurgeon and my phone kept ringing and I was like, this is weird. So I just kept silencing it because I'm like, he knows I'm in a meeting. Why is he calling me? It didn't even click at the time. Finally, there was a knock at the door and someone came in and said, Melanie, you need to step out. Something's wrong with one of your children. And possibly vasovagal a little bit, all the blood <laughs> yeah, <that's... laughs> went from my face. I went pale. I wasn't sure if I was going to pass out or throw up which one, but I knew I just needed to get to the phone call Jason, see what happened, get down to the ER, figure out what was going on. So I walked down to the meeting, uh, not to the meeting, I'm sorry, to the emergency room on the phone with my husband. And he had got a call from our nanny that he, she couldn't really get him to wake up. So thankfully, my mother lives about two miles from us. So we had her drive over there and we've trained everybody on what to do should a situation like this arise. And my mom gets there and she panicked. Grandma, panic mode, level 100. Didn't know what to do, talking to me. Call 911, call 911, you need an ambulance. This is what you need to do. And I'm talking for, through the steps of what she needed to do before 911 got there. And as it turns out, she was panicked and couldn't do it. She couldn't figure it out. She couldn't figure out how to give him his medicine that he needed. And so I, calling neighbors, I'm like, are any of you home? I need you to go over and do this. And I finally got the neighbor three houses down. And she's like, I just left, do I need to go back? I said, you need to go back. And her son has a severe peanut allergy and she's had to use the EpiPen before. Oh, you got the EpiPen knowledge. She's had to use the EpiPen before. So I'm talking her through it of how to pop the top on his Activile and draw up the medication because it's not like an EpiPen, right? You have to draw the medication up and then administer it. So I'm talking her through that, and she gave the injection that he needed. The ambulance got there. There were some things that could have gone a little smoother, and by the time he got to the ER, the, I said, look, don't, I had half the hospital, literally, neonatologists, pediatricians, everybody waiting in the ER for my son to get there. And I said, don't need a report, just put him in this bed. And we went to work with what we needed to do, and honestly, ever since then, it's been my husband and I's mission to educate as much as we can and make sure that should this situation ever arise again for our, not only our child, but any child, that people are prepared and know what to do. So this is, uh, you know, thinking about this from the 
EMS education side, this is really, you know, this is a parent's worst nightmare. You know your child has medical problem. You have the medical knowledge to deal with it. You're stuck in a meeting. You can't access your child. And you're at the mercy of the 911 system, which in our situation, we hope, we teach, we train for that to be a positive, but it's not, it's not always. And so this is uh, the, the dreaded adrenal crisis that has a few pages in the paramedic text, a few more pages in the emergency medicine text, but this is not one that we see every day, every month, maybe even every year. But this is one with some pieces that are absolutely vital and with some relatively simple steps, we can head these off at the pass, at least put some duct tape on the problem in the pre-hospital setting and set the table for resuscitation, thorough resuscitation to happen in the ED. So that's the spot we have to stop and acknowledge the fact that everybody listening, my own brain is doing the adrenal gland. What's the adrenal gland? That's that thing that sits on top of the kidneys. We think about it with epinephrine and norepinephrine because it releases those catecholamines, but it also releases some hormones and it's pretty darn important for homeostasis. So before we go any further, tell the listeners what the adrenal glands do. Just real basic. Yeah, so real basic from my standpoint, as Dr. Patrick already said, they sit on top of your kidneys, two little glands, and they are very vital for life in general. They produce very, two very important hormones, one being cortisol and the other being aldosterone. And those two hormones in and of themselves are vital to, to life, right? The cortisol helps regulate your stress response, helps control your metabolism, control blood pressure, blood sugar, and the aldosterone similarly helps control blood pressure, but it also controls your sodium and your potassium. And those things are very important. And when you have a patient with adrenal insufficiency, they don't produce those hormones. Some produce one and not the other. Some produce aldosterone, but don't produce cortisol. My son doesn't produce either of those hormones. So he relies on us to replace that for him. And luckily with modern medicine, there's medications that can do that. But that even in and of itself is not easy because when he's under stress, our body, yours and I, would actually produce more cortisol to help us compensate for that stress, whether it's physical stress, illness, emotional stress, uh, injuries from broken bones. Well, Jason and I have to be able to do that for him. So we end up tripling his steroids or we end up giving him an injection to help his body compensate. And that's an important spot to clarify for the listeners because oftentimes we talk about stress and the stress response and hemodynamic stress from a EMS standpoint as things like, you know, you're looking at shock index, you know, heart rate over systolic, you're looking at hypotension and hypoxia and signs of ischemia. And we, I won't say we minimize, but sometimes we scoot that emotional stress to the side a little bit, but it's a vital role in adrenal crisis because, especially in kids, because you can't be medically compromised as a child and not be stressed out about it yeah. from an emotional side. So usually they go together and there's a lot more overlap probably than we think about. Before we go t too much farther, let's and not drowning in because this can get very complex, like Melanie mm -hmm. said, as far as the different phenotypes of, of, a, of adrenal insufficiency and how some are hereditary and some aren't. And we are not going to be endocrinologists after this podcast. I don't think I've last I checked, that's a fellowship after an internal medicine or a pediatrics residency that takes years almost 13 years <laughs> into it i'm still not an endocrinologist. yeah i've the, learned a lot but i'm still not an expert but for for the listeners for the basics what are the most common types of adrenal insufficiency you you described your sons um can you describe that in a little more detail you said you know he doesn't make aldosterone yeah. doesn't make cortisol are just for knowledge sake what are some of the divisions there and then we'll go into sort of recognition yeah, so for sure, there's three different types of adrenal insufficiency. You have your primary, secondary, or your tertiary adrenal insufficiency. The type that my ha son has is a rare form of primary adrenal insufficiency, which probably most common and people hear about most often is Addison's disease. And that is also a form of primary adrenal insufficiency. They just get it a different way than my, my son did. It's an autoimmune. Secondary adrenal insufficiency is usually caused from 
something else. So you think of your very chronic asthmatics who are on long-term inhaled steroids, that can cause adrenal insufficiency, it's known as secondary. Cancer patients getting chemo, some chemotherapies, radiations can cause secondary. Typically, from my knowledge, and again, I'm not an endocrinologist, but in tertiary, the, usually the number one cause of that is people that have been on long-term steroids and then they just abruptly quit taking them. That's gonna send your adrenal glands back. If you, if you are fortunate enough to be able to eventually wean off of steroids, it's, it's a weaning process, not just a, I quit it and it's done. So, and the primary adrenal insufficiency form, those are usually the most severe forms and they, um, again, are lacking the production of cortisol and aldosterone. And so we're replacing that for them. And in the end, whether you're born without a functioning adrenal gland or a partially functioning set of adrenal glands primary, whether or not there's some exogenous forces suppressing your adrenal gland secondary, whether you've got some pituitary Im involvement, tertiary, that's just some knowledge for, you know, your back pocket. But the medics are telling themselves right now, this is, when am I ever going to think about this? You know, how are these kids going to present? That's really the most important piece for us as an emergency physician and as, as paramedics. How are we going to notice an adrenal crisis? When should we consider this? And what are going to be some of the main signs and symptoms? I say the number one thing, if, first of all, if it's a child, the number one thing is listen to the parents. The parents know that their child has a medical problem. They know what to do. You may come across a parent had I been at the house, I would not have hesitated. I would have given him shot. But there are parents who hesitate and who are panic. And that's, I was panicked just listening to it over the phone, right? So listen to the parents, listen to what they're telling you. I try to encourage parents of, that have children with congenital adrenal hyperplasia, say adrenal insufficiency. Don't say those three words that a paramedic is not going to know or that even an ER nurse, I didn't even know it when my son was diagnosed. I mean I know it, but I don't know that I can automatically fire off the exactly. testing. Oh my God, sodium, potassium, up, down, some fluids, I think, some steroids, and even you know, even worse, use use the acronyms, you know, C A H. Exactly. And then you're really not going to know because you have no idea. C A, it's, it's coronary that? coronary artery disease. Yeah. That's a D, and yeah. that's in adults. The the other piece from the from the notice in the presentation process is this can be really vague. You know, nausea, vomiting, malaise in the, in the age of... Abdominal pain. I mean, abdominal pain is the number one reason visit for an emergency room, mm -hmm. especially in kids. It's usually constipation, but it could be abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, listlessness, lethargy. And when someone has a low sodium, keep in mind as they, if you're treating a teenager or an adult, someone with low sodium, that can mimic intoxication. So yeah. don't write that off. If they have somebody there, if they have a dorm roommate or a roommate or somebody else that knows what's going on listen to what it is they're telling you because those signs can it can be 50 million other things that we see in the emergency room as a problem so and especially in the age of covid then you throw that on top of everything exactly for the mchd listeners out there the podcast listeners out there melanie has really described a, a point that we've talked about on the podcast before and i'll hammer it home again these may be ultra mental status patients and honestly we're never going to I, I don't like to use never or always in emergency medical care because I think that there are very few things but I don't think we're ever going to primarily diagnose an adrenal crisis without some underlying history that tells us that's what it is but what we can do is keep an open differential and remember that an altered patient that's 16 18 or 20 isn't always intoxication. So what do we think about? We think about the ultra mental status serial killers. We've talked about that on the podcast before. We've got to consider seizure and stroke and endocrine. And that's where the adrenal gland is going to fall in. So many times we think about sugar and we're going to check a sugar and that's important in the truck. But that also encompasses hyponatremia, which is going to be one of the pieces of the puzzle in adrenal classes. We don't get a, a BMP in the truck, but just don't forget that endocrine is on that list of serial killers infection is on that list whether that's primary cns or a you know septic situation and unfortunately sepsis and infection can push people with adrenal insufficiency over into crisis so they may have two things going on which is always the worst and then melanie mentioned mentioned toxins key i'll say it again 
if the only thing on your list is a toxin or an overdose, you're going to miss those other serial killers, endocrine, seizure, stroke, infection, and never leave out trauma. So the symptoms can be vague. Uh, the child will often appear unwell. Another podcast favorite the the pediatric assessment trial we uh, the triangle we have to look at it and consider you know circulation mental status respirations activity all those things we normally consider in our peds patients but the key that you really hit on is that the parents are going to know mm -hmm. and they're going to know their kids oftentimes they're going to have very detailed medications and instructions and dosing instructions so we have to listen to the parents. And guess what, listeners? The parents are going to be nervous. They're going to be stressed. They may be a little loud. They may be a lot overbearing. You know what that's called? That's called being a parent. Yeah. That's what we all are when we get that way. So we have to be smart enough communicators and savvy enough communicators to not butt heads. That's the easy, simple sort of low level response, we have to reassure, we have to show empathy, and then we have to listen. And that means taking the notebook, taking the laminated sheet and looking at that and listening and deciding, okay, we don't, you know, at MCHD, we don't have an adrenal crisis protocol, but we absolutely have structure in place for us to listen to parents and say, okay, 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 we can work with this. So what's the treatment when, when your son's in crisis or has been in crisis in the past, when he, when he's broken his arm or when he's had gastroenteritis or, you know, bronchitis with, with uh, COVID or you name, yeah. you name the, the illness that you get through your life as a child and you guys have dealt with crises and, and uh, extra medication probably a million times, what's the key? For sure. And the number one most important thing in a true adrenal crisis, like what my son experienced at the age of 18 months old, is to not hesitate, give him his emergency injection of solucortaf. It, you guys don't carry it on the ambulance, you carry solumedrol. Solumedrol will do the same exact thing. It will help this child. Um, I carry, and I don't know if we can see it, a, an injection kit. It has a little medical label on it that says emergency medications inside. So we have one everywhere we go. Number one most important thing. We have been fortunate enough that since that occurred, even with having a very crazy boy who likes to break bones we've not had to inject him since that day we treat it with triple dosing his steroids and at times there's times i go higher than a triple dose if i think you know what this just isn't quite enough let me give him more uh, gastroenteritis i mean how many times do you get that as a kid growing up a ton and vomiting is one of my my husband laughs at me when my son vomits i'm because i'm already like okay where are the drugs at let's go get this and it's a constant right away you know, I let his stomach calm down for a second and then I'm giving him his medication. So it's triple dosing those steroids. And if it's to the situation of calling 911 for an ambulance, you need to give an injection. So, in, and that's where the parents are going to have Sawyer Cortef at home. They're going to have most of the time the supplies to give it and they're going to have dosing instructions. Now, not all parents may be home. They may be at a movie theater they may be at a, a a ball game they may be at a, a camp somewhere where they don't have those instructions so talk a little bit about how solute cortef is dosed and given what oral steroids you have and how those are dosed and given and then we can lead into well, what if you don't have those things what else can you do so for sure so as i said earlier my son takes two medications because he doesn't produce cortisol he also doesn't produce aldosterone so to, for the cortisol replacement, he takes hydrocortisone. And it's just similar to if, you know, you got had an allergic reaction and had to be placed on steroids, similar to that. He takes hydrocortisone four times a day. Uh, and he will take that medicine four times a day until he's reached his full growth potential after puberty, at which time he can go to a longer acting oral steroid, such as prednisone, dexamethasone is an option but usually people don't choose it just because of the side effects mm -hmm. are much more severe so he'll be on hydrocortisone four times a day and the second is a mineral corticoid steroid and that's fludrocortisone also known as fluoronef and that is the steroid that helps his body retain sodium because he is a salt wet waster he pees out his sodium 
And so he needs a mechanism to be able to retain sodium, and that's the Florinef. Now, the Florinef, we never change the dose on that. We never have to increase that. The hydrocortisone for the cortisol to help with the body's stress response is what we increase when, during stress-related issues. So parents are going to give their kids extra steroid pills, hydrocortisone being the most common. Most emergency physicians and emergency providers are probably most familiar with prednisone. Mm -hmm. There are some detailed differences between prednisone, hydrocortisone, dexamethasone. Bottom line being, if they have their own medicine and they know their own doses, then they can absolutely up their own oral meds. Now, a lot of times in these crises, whether it's gastroenteritis or sepsis or a head injury or COVID or whatever it is that's, you know, a listless 18-month-old, sometimes the ability to take PO is lost. So we move to... So at that, at that point, yes, if, and even with gastroenteritis, we're going to attempt to give oral first. If he can't hold that medication down for at least 30 minutes, we're going to inject him. We're going to give him an injection and head to the hospital if we need to head to the hospital. And that's, and that's IM? That's IM. From, yes, I'm sorry. Yeah, from a parent form. Now, if you're there and you're the medic on scene and the child's vomiting, then you do what you normally do. You place an IV, you can start some fluids, and you can give... For the MCHD listeners out there, for non-MCHD folks, follow your protocols. But if you have a parent that says, hey, my child's sick, they're vomiting, I've given three doses of oral hydrocortisone, they vomited it up, you get the kid, you look, oh, yeah, assessment triangle, poor cap refill, tachycardic, they look dry, let's do an IV, let's do a fluid bolus. You can absolutely give the home steroid, steroid yes. uh, at the home dose via the parent. That's totally fine. That would require, you know, most of the time uh, uh, here at MCHD, a district chief consult. That's okay. And every uh, everyone would, would support that. That's, you know, we don't want to wait forever. If, if you need to talk to Dr. Dixon and I, we're available as well. That's one that uh, we would absolutely say, yes, go ahead and give the home dose of Solucortef. That's, that's totally reasonable. Now, if you're at a event, if you're at a camp if you're at a church if you're somewhere where the parents aren't around let's say it's a 14 year old and they're you know at a at a track meet or something like that then any steroid is better than no steroid and we can we can get lost in the details sometimes i feel like even as, as er docs if you have a sick adrenal crisis they need some steroid now ideally for different reasons some steroids have more desirable properties up yes. front. I'm not going to get into I didn't that. Go that's, into those details, <laughs> but yes, it's a little too much. But I mean, at other services I'm involved at, we have dexamethasone instead of solumedrol. It really wouldn't matter in that initial crisis phase. From from my perspective, correct me if I'm wrong. Some steroid is going to be markedly better than none. From a dosing standpoint, you dose within your protocols, and 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 give give it. And a hundred percent, give what you have. I mean, my son's a teenager. I stress the importance of him. I'm like, okay, you're going to ride your bike to the pond to go fishing. You need to take your shot kit with you. But teenagers are teenagers and sometimes they may forget it. And should something happen to him out there, right? We want people to know, here, you got a medical alert on, this is what's wrong with him. Just give the steroids. And if you have to call to get an order, call to get the order. Anything's better than nothing. And when my, uh, to be honest, when my son was in the ER, my medical director happened to be staffing. I was the nursing director of the ER. My medical director was staffing and he looked over at me and he goes, what do I do? And he said, what should I do? And I just rattled it up. This is what we need to do. We need to get a line. But before that, because they were having a hard time getting a line, I said, give him a second shot. He had already, my neighbor had already given him the first shot. Give him another IM shot of the steroids. Let's try and get a line. Let's give some D5 half normal saline. Let's draw these labs. And he's like, okay. And he just literally did everything I said. And a couple points for EMS folks out there. Line's going to be tough in these mm -hmm. kids, these sick kids. For Especially the MCH little kids. Yeah, for too. the MCHD listeners, we're IO pro. Get an IO. That way we can get the fluids in. A lot of times that's going to really buy us time mm -hmm. and allow us to rehydrate the kids so that we can get the IV once the patient gets to the hospital. You may be saying, well, we don't have an adrenal crisis protocol, Doc. How do we know how much to give? Pull your asthma protocol, pull your croup protocol, and give the steroid in the dose that you would give it to a kid for asthma or for croup. If you're a hand-heavy user like we are at MCHD, just 
be in the range for an yeah. adult. 125 of solumedrol will be great. We give 125 all the time for allergic reactions and for asthma. If you're a dexamethasone service, eight to 10 milligrams of dexamethasone for an adult would be would be fine. Yeah. Maybe be, would be way better than nothing. You hit on a point earlier, and you just hit on it again. And I want to make sure that I mention it before I forget about it. Is you talked about your son going fishing and forgetting his pack. I, I've got a I've got 14 year old and 16 year old boy at home now. My daughter is off to college. Uh, I feel old this week. It's My a, daughter it's a turned 18 today. It's her birthday. It's off a, at college. It's yes. a big. It's a big <laughs> week for for uh, old man here at home. Feeling uh, like I got to change the way I grocery shop. I have one less a vacuum cleaner to, to feed but my boys forget something to for school every single morning and they're they're good kids but man they they forget stuff every single day so we talked also on our recent anaphylaxis podcast and melanie mentioned this about you know epi pens and having a parent around that uses an epi pen but we know from anaphylaxis research that parents forget good parents forget they leave them and then when they're forced with a situation to now I've got to stab my kid in the thigh, they lock up sometimes. Mm-hmm. Grandmas 100%. lock up, moms lock up, dads lock up. So we have to remember, number one, that just like in anaphylaxis, they may not have their cellular cortex with them. They may forget their bag. If they have their bag, they may not be able to use it. They may not be able to get into their primary care, or their endocrinologist, because they don't have coverage or uh, appointments are six months away happens in america they may not have the money to buy their their medication so we want to encourage families and patients families to use their own when they have it but we can't assume that they a will know how we'll be able to pull it off or we'll have access to it so when we roll up in the truck we have to be ready to use our own steroid if if we have to yes and that will obviously be a much relief to the parent if you're able to to help in those situations I know I try to do everything I can I've tried to think through every scenario of what could happen what if we're all in the car and we get in a wreck and I'm unconscious how are they going to know and I tell you I may go overboard but I have seatbelt covers in the seat that he sits in that says this is a medical condition you open it up it has a picture of him in case somebody else is in that seat and that's not who you are treating right so I've, I've tried to do everything I can and think through every scenario but there always there always be something that that comes up and the most important thing is give the steroids if you give 125 milligrams of solumedrol to a five-year-old they're gonna use it, it it's not they're gonna burn that off it is not gonna hurt them yeah so and and I think you know for the medics out there very basic first piece of EMT school look for bands listen to patients look for you know wristbands bracelets all the things that patients have and when you see adrenal hyperplasia or adrenal disorders the one beauty of this whole thing is the treatment in and of itself is pretty straightforward there's not a lot of other magic it's you have to give the patient steroids Steroids. so their homeostasis corrects and that can be any steroid and honestly i'm glad you said it i didn't know that i really wanted to say it but if you give a five-year-old 125 milligrams of solumedrol that's infinitely better than giving zero. A hundred percent. And I try to tell other parents as I talk to them through different forums, you're not going to hurt them by giving them the steroids. They are going to use it. It's going to wear off. If they didn't need it, it's not going to hurt them. It's not going to hurt them. So listening folks out there, medics, other medical professionals, the worst thing you can do in this situation is A, not listen to the parents and B, not act. You have to listen to parents and we have to have empathy and we've got to get to that action phase and that's really just giving them the steroids now we're still going to do all the other pieces of our altered mental status puzzle we're going to get access we're going to give fluids if fluids are needed in a lot of cases these will be fluids aren't going to hurt the kids because most of the time there's sodium down as well so whether we're given lr or normal saline or whatever you carry on your truck that's a good thing Mm -hmm. checking a sugar we can't forget that it could be other endocrine problems we have to think about a temperature and make sure there's not a coexisting infection we have to you know make sure we look for signs of trauma unfortunately non-accidental trauma exists in kids so that's another piece of the puzzle we can't close our eyes to the rest of the possibilities but if you've got a parent holding a laminated sheet or that notebook that i've seen in the ed that says my child has cah here's what i give them go straight to that don't pass go don't collect two hundred dollars 
if your protocol allows it, give the steroids. If you're in a situation where you don't have a protocol for it, use your steps here at MCHD. That's district chief consult, MD consult, and do it quickly because the worst thing you can do is wait and not do anything. And I wanted to say one thing from a parent perspective, just the last thing is, if you have an 18 month old and you're taking them and they're not reaching back for their grandma or their mom, or you're putting them on an EMS stretcher and putting a five point harness on them and they're letting you do that, you're putting a non rebreather on them and they're not flailing their head around, most toddlers are like Hulk Hogan. And you know, it takes five of us in the ER to hold them down to do anything. So if this child is letting you do all of that, that's a problem. There's only one reason, and that's they're sick. And that's one of my favorite lines. I love taking care of kids. It, it's one of the best parts about it, being an emergency doc. And one of the things that parents inevitably say with a one-year-old or two-year-old or a three-year-old, you know, they start to fight you and they start to scream. They start to kick. And they're there because they're sick. And the parents look at me and say, oh, doc, I'm so sorry. Don't apologize. Yeah. That's a really good thing. Yeah. That checks a box on my list very high that the child is appropriately resistant. So mm -hmm. Melanie's point is a perfect one to close up with. If the child is not fighting you at 12, 18, 24, 36 months, you got a sick kid. You got to go back to the assessment triangle. You got to go back to your objective vital signs and really reassess whether it's adrenal hyperplasia, yeah. whether it's an adrenal crisis, an endocrine crisis, or any of the others altered mental status serial killers, you got to open up your differential. So it's a good conversation, yes, a great uh, perspective from both. Uh, the, the, the best part about this for me, I, I know your husband and I talked to him about this well, and you're both medical professionals, and having that perspective as a parent, a medical provider, emergency medical provider, and then seeing the system from the other side and seeing it maybe not work as smoothly as it should really brings power to the story. And so I appreciate you coming on and telling our listeners about it. This is something that we all can go back to our techs and refresh a little bit. I don't think all of us are out there really brushing up on the adrenals every night, but this is one that is definitely low frequency, but it's surely high risk. And the best part about this one for me is the end is really pretty simple. Yeah. You, you just have to pull the trigger on steroids. And to do that, you just have to listen to the parents. And so the, the key take home points in this one are just not as long as some other ones. There's no complicated algorithm here. If you have an adrenal crisis, you give steroids and that's at least the duct tape in the pre-hospital yeah. setting. Absolutely. So we will link up, Melanie has a bunch of good educational resources, uh, resources for yes. us. We'll link those in the show notes. If I'm sure I'm going to volunteer you a little bit, but I know that you're active in talking about this in various group settings. If you want to talk to, to Melanie more, uh, just email us podcast at mchd tx.org. And I'm happy to uh, hook any of the listeners up, any other EMS folks out there that would like to hear her story in whatever forums you have. I know that I know that that's a, a, a passion of hers. As always, Wherever you listen out there, whether you're watching us on YouTube or listening on, on Spotify or Apple or Google Play or wherever you listen, please leave us a review as long as it's going to be five stars. If you want to leave a four-star review, then you can just keep that to yourself. Thanks, everybody, for listening. Thank you, Melanie, for Thanks joining for us. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. We'll be back again soon with a new episode.